Coming up next on C-SPAN, it's a hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. The subcommittee met on Wednesday to discuss pending cable legislation. The hearing focuses on must-carry and vertical horizontal integration issues. Democratic Representative Edward Markey of Massachusetts chairs the subcommittee. Good morning. Today the subcommittee will hold its fourth in a series of legislative uh, hearings concerning the cable television industry. The issues before the subcommittee today include cable carriage of broadcast signals and the public policy implications of vertical and horizontal integration in the cable industry. Almost since the day the Cable Act of 1984 was passed, the broadcaster cable relationship, particularly the must-carry rules, has been at issue before this subcommittee. I remain optimistic that as the subcommittee moves on cable legislation, we will find a must-carry solution that works for all parties, broadcasters and cable. The surest way to resolve this important issue is for intra-industry discussion and cooperation. The cable industry and the public television community has reached a compromise solution. H.R. 4415, legislation introduced by the Chairman of the Full Energy and Commerce Committee, and that I was proud to be co-author along with the ranking members of the full committee and the subcommittee, Mr. Lent and Mr. Rinaldo, certainly will be included in any cable package. I hope that beginning with the record developed in the hearing this morning, we will be equally successful in fashioning a solution ensuring cable carriage of commercial broadcast stations. If there has been one consistent theme throughout the course of these hearings, it has been our desire to ensure an increased competition in the video marketplace. The witnesses on the second panel this morning will consider how and whether increased vertical and horizontal integration in the cable industry has affected competition in the provision of video programming. The second panel also will discuss whether consumers have benefited or been harmed by this trend towards concentration and what, if any, legislation or regulatory curbs on cable concentration are necessary or warranted. As we begin this hearing, I want to restate my commitment to moving legislation this year. It is my expectation that the subcommittee will move to markup in June. We have developed an excellent and comprehensive record and we are much closer to resolving the difficult issues that have arisen in the six years since deregulation of the cable industry. Before proceeding, I want to apologize to our witnesses. Because of changes uh, in the full committee markup schedule, we moved the start of the hearing up one half hour to nine o'clock, and we will have to conclude this hearing promptly at 10.45. I know that uh, several of the witnesses have traveled great distances to be here with us today, and I hope that the change in schedule does not cause any great uh, inconvenience, uh, but I felt it was important for us to nonetheless uh, conduct this hearing today uh, rather than having to postpone it to another day. And uh, I hope that you can all be understanding. Uh, with that, the time for the opening statement of the chair has expired. The chair now turns to uh, recognize the gentleman from the state of Iowa, Mr. Taki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I don't have an opening statement prepared, but it's never stopped me before. Uh, I, I, I do want to uh, just briefly, uh, uh, first of all, join with you in, in, in uh, welcoming our witnesses. Uh, secondly, I too apologize that not only do we have to have a short hearing, but I have a bill on the floor uh, beginning at 10 o'clock that uh, was not scheduled till late last night, so I have to uh, uh, move uh, off out of here and onto that uh, project. I do want to uh, uh, commend those who have been involved in uh, reaching an agreement between cable and public television on uh, the carriage issue. And certainly we hope that uh, that will be a precursor of a resolution of the must carry issue uh, for commercial uh, television stations. <clears throat> and uh, I join with my colleagues in encouraging that resolution. Uh, finally, I want to uh, 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 welcome uh, 
uh, Jim Headland, who is making his first appearance as president of the Association of Independent Television Stations. But Mr. Chairman, if he keeps coming in with testimony like this, I think we're going to have to reconsider inviting him. This is a little tough to read in a few mo moments. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's going to be a useful doorstop, however, for uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, no, we very much appreciate the detailed analysis. Thank you, Ms. Hedlund. Uh, the chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from the state of Oklahoma, Mr. Zainer. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've uh, given my views on the cable industry, I guess, at length in past hearings. I'm not going to repeat, hopefully, anything I said in the past, but I do want to add a few thoughts to the principal subject before us this morning, must carry. To me, it's one of those issues that just won't go away. It's been especially frustrating because everyone, broadcasters, Congress, even the cable industry, has agreed for years that must carry should be restored. But the problem is in the details, how you go about doing it. And details are what have kept the industry from reaching a must carry agreement. This morning, hopefully, We'll hear about how those details should be resolved. The cable industry will probably claim that broadcasters want to meddle in the business practices of cable systems by forcing them to carry broadcast signal stations on specific channels. Broadcasters will complain that cable uses channel position to put broadcasters at an unfair advantage. And I guess if you really analyze both of those statements carefully, they have, each have merit. I continue to expect the industries to solve these problems amicably and present them to us as a good faith compromise, even though strains have developed over the past year between the two industries. But I do want to offer this morning one piece of advice to both sides. I think it's in your best interest to resolve those issues now rather than have us resolve them for you. I know from talking to all of you over the past year that resolution of the must-carry and channel positioning issues is within your grasp if you put your minds to it. The Cable Association and the public TV sta stations showed how possible it was two months ago with their must-carry agreement. And I certainly want to take this opportunity to commend them for their good work. I'm glad that the majority and minority leadership of this committee could play a role to, to encourage that agreement. We introduced H.R. 4415, the Public TV Cable Carriage Act, to provide the legislative vehicle for the public TV must carry. I commend the bill to my colleagues on the subcommittee and urge you to become co-sponsors. Cable and public TV hammered out an agreement that's fair to both sides and benefits both sides. Most of all, it benefits the public who will be assured of receiving the public television which their tax dollars support. Commercial TV stations in the cable industry clearly have it in them to reach a similar accord. But time is running out. I believe that the train's going to leave the station very shortly on cable television. So it's in the interest of both industries to reach an agreement that Congress can evaluate and approve. If you don't, we'll have to do it for you. And there's a good possibility then that you're not going to be satisfied with the results. Broadcasters and cable have fought tooth and nail for the last year and in reality have achieved nothing of substance. You know, um, <clears throat> doctors used to believe a little bloodletting was a good thing occasionally. I hope that any bloodletting of the past year has convinced both industry that's, industries that's now the time to face facts. Cable needs broadcasting because broadcasting TV is the most popular programming. Broadcasting needs cable because it's the major pipeline into the home. That mutually beneficial and dependent relationship should lead you to cooperate and not argue. As a first step in resolving your differences, I urge you to work in earnest to complete a must-carry agreement that all segments of the industry can support as soon as possible. If you don't, I think you'll squander a golden opportunity to set the terms of an agreement that can benefit both sides and set the tone for greater industrial stability throughout this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired, and I agree with the gentleman from New Jersey. I think it's important for this debate to avoid that kind of bloodletting over the years. Both sides have tended to believe that uh, Dracula was in charge of the blood bank, and uh, we've got to reduce that 
tendency that uh, can oftentimes characterize these issues. Do any other members seek recognition at this time? Chair uh, does not see any members seeking recognition. So we'll turn to our first uh, panel, which uh, consists of Mr. George Miles, Jr., Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for WNET, testifying for the National Association of Public Television Stations. Mr. Thomas Goodgame, President of the Television Station Group of Westinghouse Broadcasting, testifying for the National Association of Broadcasters. Mr. James Mooney, President of the National Cable Television Association. Uh, Mr. Jim Hedlund, President of the Association for Independent Television Stations. Mr. Sharon, uh, Ms. Ms. Sharon uh, Ingram, uh, Chairperson of the National Federation of Local Cable Programmers. And Mr. Lowell, W. Paxson, President of the Home Shopping Network. Again, we're on a, uh, a tight schedule this morning, and the cooperation of the witnesses would be uh, much appreciated. Um, we would request that you each uh, keep your opening statement to five minutes. We'll monitor that uh, closely. Uh, and then we'll try to have a, a spirited exchange uh, that uh, will uh, uh, allow us to flesh out uh, some of the issues in more detail. So we welcome you, um, Mr. Miles, and whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you have such a tight deadline, I will sort of say in conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, as you said, I'm, I'm the Executive Vice President Chief Operating Officer of 13 WNET in New York, and I'm testifying as a National Association of Public Television Stations board member on behalf of our member stations. We strongly urge the support of H.R. 4415, which for the first time will codify must-carry protection for public television services. Many issues before you in this hearing are hotly disputed. The principle of must-carry for public television is not. H.R. 4415 reflects the terms of an agreement reached by NAMPS and NCTA. It represents a reasonable balancing of the goals of public television, which you have helped to set with the business interests of the cable industry. H.R. 4415, co-sponsored by yourself, Chairman Dingell, Representatives Lent, Rinaldo, represents a sensible, bipartisan approach to must-carry for public television. It provides valuable protection to public television stations without unduly burdening the cable television industry. Public television is home to some of the best programs available anywhere. Public television stations serve their communities with locally produced programs, such as the 11th Hour, a half hour of public affairs program that airs five nights a week on my station, WNET in New York. WNET is also committed to local educational services. For the past year, we have been involved in a community campaign calling attention to the crisis of urban education through programming and outreach activities. To serve the region's school children, we broadcast more than 1,200 hours of instructional program last year with secondary school programs aired overnight to teachers to tape to allow teachers to tape them for use at their convenience. Public television is available to almost everyone. More than 98% of American homes receive at least one public television station. In a typical week, over half the nation's households with more than 87 million people tune in. In the course of a month, that figure increases to 80% of all households with 156 million people. It's important to note that our viewers closely mirror the country as a whole in terms of income, race, and educational level. Those who watch public TV are not just passing time choosing the least objectionable program. Survey after survey places PBS at or near the top of program services that viewer find, viewers find most satisfying. The growth of cable has changed the economics of television. Cable television has become the dominant delivery system for television. More than 57% of American homes now subscribe to cable television. The consequence is simple. Any broadcaster who wants to reach his audience must be carried on cable TV. Unfortunately, the growth of cable TV carries with it the potential to undermine the allocation policy crafted by the FCC. Under current law, cable systems are free to carry whichever signals they want. In the absence of regulation, cable companies have an incentive to maximize profits on every one of the 35 or more channels that they typically deliver. In the current system, public TV is at a natural disadvantage compared with most other program services. Our stations are owned by universities, school systems, and nonprofit community groups. We cannot offer an equity position to major cable operators, nor can we offer advertising time to cable systems as do many program services. In summary, public television stations support 
continuation of a long-standing congressional policy to make a distinctive, non-commercial public broadcasting available to all Americans. The growth of cable does not alter that policy. Public television has become an invaluable part of the media diversity that Congress has mandated. Now that, uh, that a public television system is available nationwide, we must guarantee all viewers, including cable viewers, have access to their local public television stations. H.R. 4415 has a simple goal, to mandate access by, by the public to public television programming they support. It's a goal that NCTA supports on behalf of thousands of cable systems around the country. Congress, the FCC, state governments, educational institutions, and millions of viewers have nurtured public broadcasting over the last 40 years. H.R. 4415 is an insurance policy guaranteeing that the system we have built so painstakingly will continually to be available to all Americans on cable as well as over the air. Many issues involving cable regulation are controversial. Our issue is not. The public would clearly be served by a must-carry requirement for all public television services. Therefore, we respectfully urge this subcommittee to take action as quickly as possible to ensure must-carry regulation for our public television services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Miles, very much. Uh, Mr. Goodgame, welcome back again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. Since this is our only opportunity to provide our subcommittee with a view of what Congress should do about cable television, our comments, and I hope your questions, will go beyond carriage issues. We also will touch briefly on MFJ legislation. We know the committee will consider MFJ on a separate track but we want you to know that broadcasters do, in fact, have a definite perspective. Mr. Chairman, I don't think there is any question that decisive action must be taken by Congress soon to remedy the problems we face in the video marketplace today. An imbalance of significant proportions has occurred. This imbalance is caused by cable having two revenue streams, while free over-the-air broadcasters rely on advertising revenues alone. The cable industry of 1990 is dramatically different from its humble beginnings 30 years ago. It has achieved great financial success, in great part as a result of the deregulation which Congress gave it in the 1984 Cable Act. But far too many in the cable industry have taken unfair advantage of the powers which that financial success has wrought, abusing both cable consumers and broadcasters alike. The public has experienced extraordinary rate increases, which are the principal political forces behind the push in Congress to re-regulate cable. In addition, cable systems have denied access to broadcasters to reach the cabled audience and have resorted often to channel repositioning to disadvantage broadcast signals and confuse the public. Cable's vertical and horizontal integration have acted to increase its market power. Even the cable industry admits that some legislation is inevitable and necessary. Some of the members of this subcommittee believe that the solution is competition. A careful look at the likely prospects, however, finds no real competition for cable for years to come. While DBS, wireless cable, or other delivery services are being touted, as they were in 1984, none is likely to achieve the penetration necessary to be a competitor to cable systems any time in the foreseeable future. Others see telco entry using fiber optic technology as a solution yet that potential is at least 10 to 15 years away. Further, if Congress allows telco entry through modification of the MFJ or cross-ownership provisions of the 84 Act, it should do so cautiously and avoid exacerbating the current situation by replacing one monopoly with another. The telcos, whether our box or independents, can only be permitted in as overbills and must be restricted to their historic role as common carriers nor can they be program originators or suppliers. If broadcasters have learned anything from our experience with cable, it is that there must be a separation between the provider of the conduit and the provider of the content. So where does that leave us? The task before this subcommittee is to enact a reasonable measure of regulation, re-regulation for the cable industry that will foster a more balanced, competitive environment for broadcasters and will provide needed consumer protection. We support the thrust of the legislation presented to this subcommittee by Congressman Jim Cooper. His bill addresses several of the problems caused by cable's unregulated monopoly. We urge the subcommittee to use this bill as the vehicle for a subcommittee markup. The bill provides for must carry and channel positioning protections to ensure that broadcast signals can reach every viewer with or without cable. Given the growing penchant of the cable industry to refuse carriage to local broadcast signals, 
or to place them in less desirable positions on their cable dials, Congress must ensure that local broadcasters can still reach the audiences they were licensed to serve. The bill also contains the power to regulate cable rates so that consumers can be protected from abuse and broadcasters can have some kind of check and balance against cable's increased siphoning of programming such as major sporting events. The Cooper bill also provides for some minimal structural limitations on horizontal and vertical integration which the committee should consider. If Congress believes that maintaining our system of free over-the-air broadcasting is in the national interest, then it must take actions which will prevent those who control the conduit from further eroding our ability to serve the American public. We hope you will include in your deliberations the continuing problem of the subsidy that broadcasters provide the cable industry. Mr. Chairman, your subcommittee has heard and read the evidence. It is now up to Congress to return some level of order to the American video marketplace before cable uses its video gatekeeper status to further monopolize the American view public and to put its competitors, including broadcasters, in jeopardy. The time has come to act and to act decisively. I urge you to move forward with meaningful legislation and begin the long road back toward a marketplace where broadcasters, cable, and others can truly compete. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Goodhame, uh, very much. Um, Mr. Mooney, whenever you feel comfortable. Mr. Chairman, it's uh, diffi difficult to parse out in the space of five minutes the somewhat complicated and even tangled issues which have sprung up between the broadcast and cable industries. So I'm just going to hit some of the main themes and ask that you include my fuller statement in the record. Without objection, it will be included in the record in its entirety. Can you move the microphone in just yeah, a little bit closer? Yeah, sure. Um, in a nutshell, I think that much of the political stress between these industries has arisen because while cable continues to provide consumers with a local antenna service, extending the reach and clarity of local TV station signals, we also now provide our subscribers with an average of 28 nationally distributed cable channels and people hooked up to the cable now have a host of alternative viewing opportunities. Uh, it's important to note that broadcasting is still dominant. Uh, the broadcast networks still get about, and this is conservative, a 60 percent share of primetime viewing and the Indies get about 16 percent for a total of 70 Uh, it's important to note that broadcasting is still dominant. Uh, the broadcast networks still get about, and this is conservative, a 60 percent share of primetime viewing, and the Indies get about 16 percent for a total of 76 percent going to commercial broadcasting on an average evening. Uh, moreover, while we hear a great deal of unhappiness expressed these days by the broadcasters over the alleged unfairness of cable's dual revenue stream, uh, subscriber fees and advertising, the broadcasters still get 92 cents out of every dollar spent on television advertising. And their total industry revenues amount to nearly 26 billion a year, while total cable revenues are about 16 billion. Uh, now, up until last fall, uh, the broadcaster cable issue largely involved must carry and channel positioning. Uh, since last November, however, uh, the broadcast organizations seem to have expanded it to include everything from cable rate regulation uh, to how we get our franchises renewed. And a casual observer might conclude that they're simply out to sink us. Uh, there are a lot of theories as to why the broadcast trade groups all of a sudden have gone to a full-scale assault against cable, uh, but the nub of it, I think, is that with the proliferation of independent broadcast stations, uh, there are now 417 indies as opposed to 134 in 1980. The broadcasting business itself has become intensely more competitive than it used to be. And cable, whose viewing share in the aggregate is the equivalent of a fourth broadcast network, has made the television business still more competitive. Uh, this makes the broadcasters unhappy, and they're testing the political waters to see what relief might be available. Uh, what we've got here then, uh, in my opinion, in terms of recent efforts by some of the broadcasters to seek regulatory restraints on cable, is a kind of ad hoc alliance among players 
in different sectors of the broadcasting industry who want to brand cable as a kind of illegitimate competitor in the hope that the government will do something to give them a leg up in getting back that 20 percent or so of audience share they've lost entirely and even more important uh, to help them uh, from losing any more. We hope you'll not do that but hope also in the interest of resolving any perceived imbalance between the two industries that you will resolve the one matter which a lot of people seem to think should be resolved and that is the issue of must carry and the related issue of channel positioning. Uh, we're perfectly happy that there should be a reasonable must carry rule and have already worked out a compromise with the public broadcasters on a rule covering their stations uh, which we've jointly recommended to the committee. Uh, agreement with the commercial broadcasters has proven somewhat more elusive but I do not see any reason that cannot be achieved also if the two sides genuinely want to reach agreement. Uh, we certainly do and in that respect I want to say how much we appreciate the encouragement both sides are being given by the chairman of the subcommittee uh, as well as other members uh, of this committee uh, especially by, lately by Mr. Tozen, who's been quite active in, in trying to promote some kind of a meeting of the minds. Uh, otherwise, uh, and once the must carry and channel positioning issues are resolved, we hope you will leave it to these industries to slug it out with each other in the television marketplace. Uh, this is the sort of contest which in the end uh, the viewing public should be the judge. I'd conclude by saying that I do not attribute to all broadcasters the somewhat protectionist motives I've described as being at the root of much of the controversy, nor do I wish to denig denigrate the broadcasting industry itself. Uh, broadcasters have made a substantial contribution to the life of the country, uh, and in any event, a lot of broadcasting companies also seem to be cable companies. Uh, but it is time to end the feuding, and we'll hope we'll do so by putting into place a reasonable must carry rule. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hedlund. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I feel a little bit like Mr. Ronaldo said earlier that INTV, not in, in my capacity, but other uh, witnesses representing us have appeared before this subcommittee on numerous occasions testifying in cable. And I, to be honest with you, don't think there is anything new I could say today that you hadn't heard. So. That being the case, uh, I propose that I will try to dispense as best I can with the normal flowery rhetoric that gets tossed out at these hearings and, and try to get right to the, the root of the issue. And, and I think in, in respect for my friend uh, Jim, who is a little outnumbered here this morning, I will also do my best not to use the, the M word when referring to the number of uh, cable systems that the average uh, consumer gets to choose among. Uh, and I also am not going to try to sit here and tell you that, that the, the free local broadcasting is an imminent danger of collapsing because of cable. Uh, I will tell you, because I believe it, that, that the quantity, the quality, and the diversity of the news, the information, the sports and entertainment programming that the people have come to expect from free broadcast television uh, will suffer and suffer severely if some balance is not returned to that marketplace. <clears throat> Seems to me the root of the problem that we have with cable is, is pretty obvious for anybody who has, who has been around the industry for a little bit. And I know when, when I left the Hill in 1981, I had the pleasure of, of working for Jim Mooney at NCTA. And my recollection of the industry, back then at least, was that the typical or average cable operator was mostly concerned with, with signing up subscribers and collecting their $7.95 a month or whatever the fee was back then and really didn't care what consumers watched on cable so long as they got the check each month. In 1990, that same average cable operator still certainly is concerned with collecting the monthly check, which has gone up rather substantially since then. But now he cares very much about what programs on the cable, what services on the cable that the subscriber watches and, and well, he should, because the major cable MSOs, which dominate Jim's industry now, increasingly have equity interest in these program services. And where they do not have equity interest, they almost always sell local advertising in those services. 
And because of that, there is a very understandable incentive created for cable operators to attempt to skew consumer viewing towards those channels in which they have a financial interest, either by means of equity ownership and vertical integration or by the sale of advertising, skew viewing towards those channels and away from channels, such as local broadcasters, in which they don't have this financial interest. We basically have, have a number of recommendations. I'll try to summarize them as, f as four major ones. First, and I think there is almost universal agreement, that the Congress should enact a reasonable, non-discriminatory must-carry rule. And to their credit, the cable industry has long been in agreement with this. Second, we believe that there need to be traffic rules of some sort to, to govern disputes over where local stations are, are carried on cable. And our objective is not to get preferential treatment, but rather to ensure that, that first, that cable does not engage in arbitrary channel shifting merely to benefit those program services in which they have a financial interest. Two, that channel positions long occupied by local broadcasters on cable systems and long promoted by those stations not be taken away without the consent of the station. And thirdly, that local stations be assigned cable channel numbers that are available and viewable on every set the consumer has hooked to the cable. Now, in this regard, the cable industry's reaction has been a little mixed of late. I'm, I'm, I have heard, and I'm delighted to have heard, that uh, all over the country, a number of Time Warner cable systems are returning local broadcasters from the cable channel Siberia and putting them back on the first 12 channels, where all of those stations will now be available to every set a consumer has hooked to cable. Uh, and I certainly applaud Time Warner for that and hope it continues. On the other hand, I've, I've just read in one of the, the trade press that TCI has announced a policy where they are going to be increasing by $2 a month the price of cable converters and offering discounts to consumers who return their converters. Now, while I think TCI has announced that it is doing this in the name of, of, of trying to moderate consumer price increases, this will have the effect, if widespread, of disenfranchising all those local stations who are carried on cable channels 14 and above. Thirdly, we believe that the number of channels in which a cable operator can have a financial interest ought to be limited to several, basically paralleling the duopoly rules that apply to broadcasters, whereby a single entity is forbidden from owning or controlling more than one video outlet in a given market. And finally, we believe that some mechanism should be found to try to stem the migration of the most popular sports programming in particular from local broadcasters and networks to pay cable services. And I won't, in the interest of time, go into the various options that might exist to that, but we believe that is a serious problem and, and threatens the existence and popularity of free television in the future. Mr. Chairman, I will conclude basically by saying that, that I think the changes I've outlined here and in my written testimony are critically needed to balance the marketplace between cable and broadcasters. But I, for one, really believe that these changes will not have a severely adverse effect on the cable industry, and it too will continue to grow and prosper, and that in this new environment, the American people are going to benefit from the robust but fair competition between these two very fine industries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hedlund, very much. Uh, our next uh, witness <coughs> is uh, Ingraham, representing is the uh, chairperson representing the National Federation of Local Cable Programmers. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, can you move the, the uh, microphone in a little bit closer, please? Would help Thank if you. it was on too. Thank you for inviting the NFLCP to appear before you today. The NFLCP is the national organization dedicated to the nationwide growth and advancement of public, educational, and governmental, or PEG access. Before discussing the impact on PEG access of must-carry and channel placement, I feel compelled to provide the subcommittee with a brief overview of the current achievements and the serious obstacles that face PEG access. Our written testimony details this further, and I hope they'll be included in the record. As cable has spread throughout the United States, something very special, but also very fragile, has grown with it, our community's right to program our own home channels. PEG access programming appears on channels set aside for community use, available to everyone on a non-discriminatory basis, generally at no charge. U.S. News & World Report recently called access participatory television because access makes TV a working tool of the ordinary citizen, the underfunded nonprofit, 
and the underserved minority community. In 1984, you, the Congress, recognized the growing importance of PEG access by giving cities the right to require such channels. Community access uniquely advances Congress's interest in localism, diversity, and free speech. Yet for all the strides we've made, we are continually exhausted by challenges. Therefore, we appeal to you to provide the legislative foundation needed for the continued growth and success of access. Here's a sampling of some fine programs and producers. Arlington, Virginia, where a series called Communicating Survival is helping immigrants adjust to American life. Palatine, Illinois, where Bob Smith is a mentally challenged TV producer trained at Project Vital. Waycross, Ohio, where Charlotte Wilson brings news about issues and services to senior citizens, many of whom are housebound. Germantown, Tennessee, where the high school kids produce a local news show. And Sharon, Massachusetts, where the school committee recently opened the phone lines for an hour before a meeting and got an hour and a half of nonstop calls. In addition, I'd like to point out a newly published book on successful use of access by nonprofits, which was published by the respected Benton Foundation and which we can make available to the committee. On generally small budgets and with limited facilities, access channels provide a wealth of community programming. PEG Access Centers contribute now over 10,000 hours every week of programming to their hometowns. Yet our funding and our channels are constantly at risk from renegotiation, transfer of ownership, shrinking local budgets, and non-compliance with franchise agreements. Although we're asked to manage an unedited First Amendment forum, we have none of the content liability protection enjoyed by cable operators. High rates and retiering are putting PEG channels beyond the economic reach of many citizens who are in desperate need of this local information. And finally, because access is not mandatory, cities often lack the clout to require it in franchise agreements, even where community need and interest are proven. Of foremost interest to NFLCP this morning is H.R. 4415. NFLCP recognizes the important role of public television, and we support protected carriage. However, we are seriously opposed to proposed Section 614D, which allows public television to be put in place of PEG channels without the current protective language existing in Section 611 of the Cable Act. While it's important to protect public television, PEG access serves vastly different community needs, and it should not be endangered by the Act. Section 614D is unnecessary, should be eliminated, since Section 611 already provides guidelines for temporary use of fallow peg channels. NFLCP also supports the broad intent of must-carry requirements, which are part of Congress's traditional support for local service and communications. However, carriage of local broadcast stations may not be sufficient for cable to reach its potential as a source of locally responsive programming and information. In this age of deregulation, there's been a measurable drop in broadcasters' community programming. Therefore, it is imperative that additional support for PEG access go hand in hand with must-carry legislation. Channel positioning is also a key issue. PEG channels are often booted to the outer reaches of the channel lineup, and in communities like mine in Acton, Massachusetts, aren't listed at all in any program guide, even on cable. More importantly, because of their very nature, PEG channels should be included in any proposed lifeline or low-cost tiers. This will necessitate some positioning on channels 2 through 13 so that viewers with low-cost dial tuners have access to community information. Our public, educational, and government access channels are creating an informed and educated citizenry who deserve to have this active community forum protected and preserved. With your help, we can work together to make access grow. I fear without the assistance of Congress, access is not going to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ingraham. And our uh, final witness on the uh, first panel, uh, Mr. Lowell Paxson is the president of the Home Shopping Network. Welcome. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Lowell Paxson. I'm president of Home Shopping Network, Inc., the nation's leading electronic retailer and according to Broadcasting Magazine, the largest group owner of broadcast stations in the USA. HSN owns and operates 12 stations, provides full-time daily programming to 16 additional affiliates, and provides part-time daily programming to 73 stations, a total of 101 affiliated stations. These affiliates reach a majority of American homes. And the statistical data on our owned and operated and full-time affiliates show that they are denied access to more than 44 percent 
of cabled homes in their market. And that percentage equates to over 11 million homes of denied cable carriage. And that's why I'm here today to testify in support of must carry. HSN appreciates this opportunity to urge enactment of a constitutionally supportable must carry law. We would like to focus on four basic points. Point one, must carry is absolutely essential for small independent local television broadcasters who are now most at risk that cable has become the dominant video delivery mechanism. Cable clearly is the gatekeeper to the home. Point two, Local television stations have an obligation under Section 307B of the Communications Act to provide programming to serve their local communities. Congress has mandated that the FCC issue and renew licenses on this basis. The government has a substantial interest in continuing this 56-year-old system of broadcast localism. Point three, must carry legislation tied to the 307B programming obligation is constitutionally sound. It obviously precludes minimum viewing standards, asks for quantitative programming standards, and carries on the tradition of localism, the cornerstone of American broadcasting. And point four, if localism is the cornerstone, then no local station, not one, should be denied access to the homes in its immediate service area. A 50-mile rule will not guarantee this access but a 35-mile mandatory carriage rule before a 50-mile carriage standard will ensure such access. And further on point one, we agree with FCC Chairman Sykes that since the enactment of the Cable Act, cable television has become the principal delivery medium for video programming, and that few cable subscribers retain the ability to receive television stations over the year. Therefore, a television station that is not carried by cable system in its market is doomed. The stations most at risk are the small independent UHF broadcasters, those on the higher frequencies, those who have come on the air in the last few years, and the minority broadcasters. In explanation of point two, the ability of viewers to have access to local broadcast programming is an important component of Section 307B because broadcasters are obligated by statute to serve their local communities. It logically follows and is incumbent upon Congress or the FCC to ensure that those signals are in fact accessible in the home. The legislative or FCC reimposition of a must carry rule will ensure such access to the local cable homes for local stations. Point three. Must carry legislation premised on Section 307B programming responsibilities and tied to the percentage of local non entertainment and issue oriented programming aired by these television stations provides a sound legal basis that would pass judicial muster. We believe that television stations who provide a significant amount of local programming should be carried by every cable system within the station's 35 mile radius. This is a logical extension of Section 307B and of the viewer's First Amendment rights. Congress or the FCC should establish a local programming baseline that can serve as an objective, narrowly tailored standard for determining these local stations entitled to cable carriage. The Senate proposal uses a 50-mile standard and we sense that we have not been successful in persuading the adoption of our 35 within a 50-mile proposal. We urge each of you to review our position on this. The use of some quantitative standard as one of the triggers for cable must carry is appropriate. The FCC would not tell any licensee to meet any particular programming guideline, but rather meeting the quantitative standard of the must carry programming threshold would be totally voluntary on the part of the licensee. And lastly, a 35 within 50 mile rule reflects today's marketplace by clearly requiring carriage of television stations in their local communities where these stations are programmed to meet local needs. The use of a 35 mile standard to define a station's local service area is also consistent with the current syndicated exclusivity and the congressional copyright regulations. In conclusion, the adoption of a 35 within 50 mile must carry law tied to section 307B and voluntary quantitative local programming baseline guidelines ensuring cable access for local broadcasters 
permits full compliance with Section 307B and will pass constitutional muster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Paxson. Now we'll turn to questions from the subcommittee. We'll begin by recognizing the gentleman from the state of New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Jim Moody uh, to, to give me an update on uh, how your negotiations are going uh, with Musk Carry. Uh, I know you've tried to work these out. and uh, Can you give us an update since the Quincy decision, Jim? Well, we ha we, since the Quincy decision, which was the second case in which Musk Carry rules were declared unconstitutional. Excuse me, that was the first case. That was the first case. Since that time, there has been a a uh, rather dedicated, uh, but but I must say frustrating also effort by the two industries, broadcasting and cable, to work these things out. Uh, I recall in January, I think, of 1986, which was about six months after the decision came down, going to the NAB meeting, winter board meeting, and holding out the olive branch on, on, on this issue. And, and happily, the following month, February 1986, we were able to work out a joint inter-industry compromise on much ca must carry, uh, which was endorsed by all of the principal uh, commercial broadcast trade associations as well as our associations. We recommended it to the FCC. The FCC put into place a rule, but lo and behold, uh, later that year, the Court of Appeals again knocked that down. And since then, there have been uh, recurrent negotiations by the parties to see if we can put uh, must carry back in place again. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, last June, for the period of somewhere between 24 and 36 hours, I thought we had a deal. <laughs> but it ultimately fell apart over the channel positioning issue, which had not been a factor in, in the previous compromise. Uh, but I, I think that building still, I, I think that that was a useful exercise in that it provides a renewed basis to build on uh, and achieve yet another compromise if we could just get this channel positioning thing solved. I mean, it is my feeling that, that it is a doable proposition <coughs> for the two industries to work something out, as has been noted several times this morning. We've already worked something out with the public broadcasters. And I think that with perhaps uh, just a little bit more encouragement uh, from the proper authorities up here, you could see uh, a compromise agreement as early as next month. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mr. Paxson, I must say, I, uh, with all due respect, I, I can see the argument in the public interest to require cable operators to carry broadcast stations uh, and, and the Duke local news and public affairs, children's programs, but why, uh, why should uh, we carry the home shopping network? Uh, what, what do you do for the public good? I mean, why, why, what is the compelling reason to, to bring you into this coverage? I, with all due respect, and I, uh, I think that, give me the, the public uh, policy answer to that question. Well, first of all, the Home Shopping Network. Could you move the microphone in a little bit closer, Mr. Pax? Thank you. First of all, the Home Shopping Network is a broadcaster and owns 12 stations and is required under Section 307B to provide the local non-entertainment informational issue-oriented program and does, as a station group, provide 20 hours a week, which is total and separately apart from its normal programming. And we are a programmer. If you look at that programming, you have to say that some of it is informational, some of it is entertainment, and some of it is commercial. If you try to distinguish between us and, say, The Simpsons, I think you begin to draw a line which is be becomes very difficult to support. We are a programmer, and we are a broadcaster. And we probably, more than many other television stations in the country and other cable systems, provide more hours per day of informational, non-entertainment, educational, and issue-oriented local programming 
than our fellow broadcasters. And by that uh, commitment, we feel we have the right to ask for access to the home in the areas that these television stations serve. The compulsory license, uh, we had the commissioners of football, baseball, uh, basketball. They basically said that uh, it was time to get rid of it. Uh, obviously, uh, this is something that uh, this committee must consider. Uh, the argument being that it's basically outlived its usefulness. Uh, Mr. Goodgame, uh, Jim Mooney, would you want to comment on that? Perhaps uh, when cable was an infant industry, maybe it was needed. Uh, what about now? Uh, what about Mr. Goodgame first and then Jim? Uh, Congressman, uh, the compulsory license, uh, of course, sort of was a companion piece, uh, from my understanding, with Muscarry. Uh, now that Muscarry is not uh, in existence, I think there is a legitimate consideration as it pertains to compulsory license. From a broadcaster's standpoint, though, compulsory license uh, really is not the answer. Uh, compulsory license, uh, the television stations buy the license uh, when they lease programming, or they lease the license when they lease programming. Uh, the networks do the same thing. Uh, there is no real financial benefit that I can see uh, to the television industry for the removal of the compulsory license. Uh, there have been other proposals advanced which have uh, been discussed in the past and will be discussed in the future. Uh, but the compulsory license plate is, uh, is basically a license plate that uh, attaches to the automobile of Hollywood and the sports community. Uh, so from a broadcaster's standpoint, it is, uh, while an issue, not a burning issue. Jim? Well, without getting into too much detail, I think the legend of the compulsory license as a benefit conferred on a fledgling industry by a benevolent Congress is a little exaggerated. Uh, one of the, the only thing the Copyright Act of 1976 worked in terms of a change in what had always gone on was that it required cable operators to pay uh, for the importation of distant signals, whereas previously they had not uh, to pay because copyright sim simply didn't cover broadcast transmissions. I think the, the uh, what the commissioners were probably talking about the other day had to do with the compulsory license as it applies to distant signals. The professional sports organizations have, have long opposed that, although I think that, uh, that their opposition is pretty much limited these days to uh, periodically showing up here, registering their views, and then not doing too much about it in, in the intervals, which is probably because side deals have been worked out with a lot of these entities in which they, they now derive substantial off-book, as it were, compensation. If you press the lawyers on the issue of compulsory license for local signals, I think what they'll tell you is that it facilitates carriage of local signals and as a legal matter, assuming you're not going to want to, again, uh, exempt broadcast signals from copyright protection, that, that what it does is, is uh, allow carriage of local signals without having to go to the original rights holders of the material that appears on the broadcast station signal. And, and I think that, and I, I'm, you know, my colleagues here from the broadcasting industry can, can disagree with me on that. I, I think that what they're after is not so much repeal of the compulsory license as the reintroduction of some form of must carry and, and uh, uh, th there's a segment of the broadcasting industry that, that apparently wants to be paid uh, for such carriage but, but none of them really want to fool with that license because it, it affects uh, the ability either to do a deal or to have the signal carried in the first place. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, continue along the same line of questioning that uh, Mr. Richardson was pursuing, Mr. Mooney. How close, in your opinion, do you think the broadcast and cable industries are now uh, to working out an agreement on must-carry provisions? I think that requires a judgment that is less scientific and more artistic, perhaps. Uh, my sense of it is quite close. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
uh, without wanting to put anybody on the spot, I, I think that uh, had it not been for the fact that the NAB uh, has long had a trip scheduled to Europe in which they're investigating various possibilities for international business, you probably could have closed it up by the end of this month. But that, again, is, is, uh, is, is, is an instinctive judgment rather than one I could demonstrate with any certitude. I mean, Mr. Hedlund is in the room. He, he might have a different view. Yes. What's your reaction, Mr. Hedlund? How do you feel about that? Do you agree with what Mr. Mooney just said? I, I agree that, that I believe there is not a great gulf to be bridged, and I think that uh, the principal parties have uh, uh, all agree that they, they need to reach an agreement and are committed to doing so, and whether it is a matter of days or weeks, I certainly think it is doable, and I think the uh, pressure and encouragement from uh, you and the chairman and others uh, uh, certainly helps that process. Mr. Goodgame, do you agree with what's been said so far? Yes, sir. Basically, I uh, am in agreement. I think there has been a concerted effort on the part of uh, all parties to reach a much must carry uh, resolution. Uh, I think that is in progress. I think the real contention uh, from a broadcaster standpoint is must carry is not the only issue uh, between cable and broadcasters, and we just don't want to uh, say must carry is it and let it all go away. Uh, but must carry can be resolved, yes, sir. Well, what are the uh, <clears throat> principal areas of disagreement that are left? Well, I think that uh, <coughs> the uh, ability for uh, the cable systems to take a broadcast signal uh, and dispense that signal for some type of pay, when one must assume that when uh, the consumer is paying for cable uh, systems uh, to come into their home, that part of that is the broadcaster signal. Uh, and uh, we are being competed with in the marketplace uh, <coughs> while we are uh, lending financial support, in essence, uh, to the cable industry. And I think that's a situation that causes us uh, a great deal of stress. I give you a classic example. Uh, with, uh, Congressman Richardson referred to sports siphoning a moment ago. Uh, in the recent negotiations with the NFL, uh, Turner Broadcasting and ESPN share a Sunday night schedule, half a season each. Uh, my understanding, uh, my memory, uh, says that about $470 million was the price that Turner Broadcasting paid for a half a season of Sunday night games. Uh, it is reported in the press, not my estimates, that almost all of that money, if not all of it, will be recovered from the cable systems, uh, who in turn must assume will recover that money from their subscribers. Uh, they go into a season in which uh, their nut, so to speak, has been covered. Uh, any advertising that they get, which I would assume would be substantive, since that's a very popular uh, sales tool, uh, is gravy. Uh, conversely, the NBC uh, television network bids 700, uh, let's say roughly three quarters of a million, I think it's 760, but I'm not sure of that figure, but it's in, it's in excess of $700 million. In order to maintain the Sunday afternoon AFC games on commercial, free, over-the-air broadcasting, they have extended their financial considerations beyond the grasp of the network to recover its costs. It has asked its owned and operated stations to contribute their revenues to the recovery of that cost and is now in the process, as I understand it, uh, of asking its affiliated stations to contribute toward the cost so they can at least break even or come close to it to maintain NFL, AFC games on Sunday afternoon to the American public. Uh, that is what one might call an unequal balance in the marketplace. What you're talking about right now is must pay, and uh, are you telling me that broadcasters are still pushing for must pay in this Congress and that you're willing to let that become an impediment to the settlement or uh, agreement? No, sir, I'm not telling you that. I'm only saying that no one should, uh, I, th I think we should resolve must carry. I think the opportunity exists now. I think that is the temperament of Congress. Uh, certainly Mr. Mooney and Mr. Fritz, uh, Mr. Hedlund, uh, and others. Uh, have continued to work toward the resolution of must carry. So 
So I don't suggest that this delay the process. I only suggest that uh, Congress nor anyone else look upon this as the final resolution of every issue that exists between broadcasters and cable. My time is rapidly running out. Let me turn to Mr. Mooney. Mr. Mooney, could you perhaps tick off the issues that remain in disagreement in your opinion and let us know whether or not you agree or disagree with what Mr. Goodgame just stated? We, we, we don't. Uh, well, Mr. Goodgame, if I hear him correctly, is saying that they're for must carry now and they're not for must pay now, so I'm going to take him at his word and not, not get into that, although I will if you, if you want. Uh, I, I frankly don't think that there are other legitimate issues between the two industries. I would simply comment on the matter of sports, uh, two things. First, it is not greeted by cable operators with unadulterated joy that uh, people can go out and make enormously uh, expensive sports contracts uh, and, and simply pass on the cost. On the other hand, you know that the characterization of all of this as siphoning, as a remnant from the 1970s when the federal government had rules which actually prevented us from buying our own programming. Uh, that's part of that rosy <coughs> history, you know, back there when we were being subsidized. Uh, and it works the other way, too, these days. Uh, ESPN, for example, made the NCAA a popular television, the NCAA finals, a popular television event, but CBS, which has bigger bucks than any of our networks, now that the thing has been made popular, has just come in and scooped it all up and taken it off cable and put on its own network to help boost its ratings and presumably its revenue. So I, I simply caution you that when you hear things like this, in the end, what a lot of people are talking about is simply money. And what I hear the broadcasters saying a lot these days is that they don't like having to pay, uh, pay, pay more for programming. It's too expensive for them. Mr. Hedlund, could you give us a quick reaction, please? Well, I, I share with, with Jim, the, the concern that we have, sometimes we, we, we categorize the cable industry as being all aspects of it. Uh, we have a problem now with a number of cable program services uh, in New York. Uh, next summer, all 162 New York Yankee games will be available only to subscribers who have and can afford cable. Uh, after an a experience of over 40 years on Channel 11 in New York, which had broadcast 100 or more games a year. Uh, you know, the cable operators in that region obviously are faced with consumer ire if they don't carry Madison Square Garden Network, but on the other hand are having the cost of an exorbitant settlement shoved down their throat. And I think, I think the sports industry or business is just different from the rest of it. They have an antitrust exemption that allows them to carve up television markets and allows them to absolutely prevent any entry into their business that they don't approve. All of the reason we don't have and probably never will have a baseball team in Washington, D.C., and that it is very possible to justify, and I think both on a business standpoint and legal standpoint, special rules governing the sale of sports uh, television rights. Okay, thank you. Uh, my time is running out, number one. Number two, I want to make this roll call. Let me just ask Mr. Paxson a final quick question. Would you explain your 35 within, uh, the importance of your 35 within 50 proposal and why it should be uh, put into effect very briefly because I'm out of time? Thank you for the opportunity. First of all, if a station is required by 307B of the Communications Act to do local programming, then he should have access to the local homes. Under a 50-mile rule, Many stations today do not have access to their local cable, and under 50 miles will not. If there were a 35 within a 50 mandatory coverage and then optional at the cable operator's discretion from 36 to 50, it would A, harm no cable or broadcaster, and all local stations <coughs> would have access to their local community. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank this very distinguished panel, and I'm sorry I have to run over to vote. The, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself. Uh, what I'd like to uh, ask the panel is uh, a question regarding the constitutionality of the must-carry rules. Uh, as you know, uh, twice the courts have tossed out must-carry rules that have been crafted by the FCC as being an infringement of the First Amendment rights of cable uh, operators. Uh, in your opinion, is it possible for a legislation to be crafted which will in fact be able to pass constitutional muster and 
to the extent uh, to which you believe that it, uh, uh, it is possible, could you uh, give us uh, the language which you believe uh, would satisfy uh, the test? Mr. Paxson? Yes, sir. I believe that it is constitutional. I think you have to pin it to 307B, which has not been done in the past. And we can look to uh, uh, Commissioner's Quello dissenting vote uh, a few years ago in which he outlined his support for 307B and felt that it was constitutional under 307B. Why don't you expand on 307B a little bit? Well, 307B is part of the Communications Act and says to the Communications uh, uh, FCC and to the broadcaster, in order to have a local license and have it renewed, you have to serve your local community with programming <coughs> that addresses the individuality of that local community. If that is a requirement to get your license and renew it, then if you do that programming, you should have certainly a constitutionally mandated by Congress or an FCC regulation which says we have access to those homes. The constitutionality under 307B would hold up and, and pass judicial muster. If you look back at the Quincy decision, the Quincy decision said you didn't show any stations at risk. Today, in, in, in a representation of 27 stations, we can show 11 million homes where cable carriage is denied within a 35-mile radius, not 50. If it was 50, the number of 11 million homes on these 27 stations would be substantially larger. You also have 210 unbuilt television station construction permits in this country. And in the last few years, the only stations that have been built, for the majority of them, and almost all of them except two, were built by Home Shopping Network, or the money was given by Home Shopping Network to minorities to build these television stations. None of the other 210 probably will be built because they cannot be guaranteed of cable coverage and cable access. Therefore, they cannot get the money to build it. You think, lastly, you think 307 then provides yes, the constitutional, constitutional hook that will but uh, the Quincy survive people, challenge? Okay, right, but, me, I just want to move okay. down here a little bit quicker. Mr. Mooney. Well, I think the Court of Appeals has twice cautioned uh, readers of its reports that it is, has not ruled that any must-carry rule is necessarily unconstitutional. On the other hand, looking at this thing realistically, the cart has fallen off the bridge twice now. And to mix my metaphors, I think this may be a little bit like baseball. You know, three, three strikes and you're out. So I would urge the Congress to be very careful about this uh, and, 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 and I would urge, in fact, my friends in the broadcasting industry who have their own internal pressures to be very careful about it, too. Uh, if this thing goes down again, as it has, twi as it has twice already, uh, I, I think it perhaps uh, may end up so stigmatized in the judicial system that uh, there, there will not be a realistic opportunity to put it together again. You believe it's possible, however? Yeah, I think it's probably possible if it's restrained and if the lawyers in charge of arguing this can free themselves from the habitual intellectual baggage uh, which has always gone along with the defense of rules of, of this kind. We, we have a curious psychological situation here where prior to the case, the lawyers defending the rule will all tell you that they're absolutely certain they're going to prevail. It's airtight. The court flattens them, and they're glum for a while. But in, after the passage of four or five months, they forget their glumness and tend to revert to the habitual arguments. So and, what, what argument you know, would you recommend that they make if the habitual <coughs> arguments are unsatisfactory? Straight Commerce Clause argument on the preservation of competition between the two industries. Okay, thank you. Mr. Goodgame. In the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, yes, I think it is. And we have included in our filing uh, briefs uh, outlining how we think that can be made constitutional. I would refer that to uh, the chairman and his committee. Okay, good. Mr. Uh, Miles. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, based on everything I've heard, we, I, we, both, we also agree that uh, this, this probably will be able to pass constitutional. I mean, based on everything we've heard from, from outside legal counsel and some of our other advisors, we feel it's, uh, it definitely will pass muster. However, just the one point is, as it relates to public television is that we're in business, we're tax supported, and we feel very strongly that uh, if um, uh, uh, that public television is going to exist with taxpayer and taxpayer money behind it, that uh, it must be some sort of a mandate that it, uh, 
public television is carried, um, is, is, is carried on cable requirement. Well, let me ask you this then, uh, Mr. Miles. The, uh, the bill which uh, Mr. Dingell and I have introduced uh, must carry, which protects the public uh, broadcasters, uh, that is the basic uh, codification of the agreement reached between the, broad, the public broadcasters and the uh, cable industry. Is it your opinion that that is constitutional? Yeah, based on uh, my advice from my outside uh, experts, uh, yes, it is definitely constitutional. Is it your opinion, Mr. Mooney, that that is constitutional? Well, I hope it is, uh, but I would caution my friends in the public broadcasting community against placing too much emphasis on the fact that public broadcasting is tax supported. You know, you can run into a rather severe constitutional difficulty if the court thinks that something is being given special treatment over and against the asserted First Amendment rights of others merely because it has to have, merely because it has government support. You know, the First Amendment in the first instance was intended uh, to, pr to protect people from governmental encroachment uh, on their rights of free speech. And, and as I point out before, this cart has fallen off the bridge twice, so it's tender. Okay. Apart from that, do you think that uh, the language that has been adopted uh, embraces the, the, uh, the themes which you uh, would argue should be the ones that are uh, relied upon? to uh, survive a constitutional challenge? We hope the thing, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a constitutional scholar, Mr. Chairman, and, and I would hesitate to pose as one. I hope the thing stands up because, frankly, we don't want to have to go through this again. All right, Mr. Hedlund? Well, I join my uh, uh, Jim in, in professing not to be a constitutional scholar. I would, I would point out two things, Mr. Chairman. The first time the rules went down in Quincy, the, the FCC under then Chairman Fowler made no attempt to defend the rules and quite clearly were <coughs> deliriously happy when they were struck down. The second time around in the Century case, the commission was lukewarm, and that's, that's an exaggeration, in their support of the rules. So I don't think these rules have had a good test with a solid, enthusiastic defense, and I uh, think that a strong, obviously can give no iron glad ironclad guarantees, but I think a combination of, of uh, uh, 307B, a straight commerce clause, and perhaps uh, tying into the cable compulsory license are all uh, uh, areas that, that hold promise. Okay. Let me ask you this, Mr. Hedlund, you and uh, Mr. Goodgame. There are a number of uh, cable proposals which are uh, floating around uh, Congress these days. Uh, that run the gamut from rate re-regulation to uh, introduction of the telephone companies uh, into, a cable, uh, into the cable industry. Uh, could you give us some rough sense of what your priorities are in terms of any legislation that we might uh, adopt this year? Uh, Mr. Chairman, at least from our perspective, we, we have uh, you know, supported uh, some pieces of legislation, including Mr. Cooper's, uh, Senator Danforth's in the Senate, those bills have provisions in them that I can honestly say have any direct impact on independent television. And I guess it's a little bit like a member of Congress co-sponsoring a bill. Doesn't mean you agree with every single aspect of it, but, but you agree in principle. Our concerns are, are basically access to the viewer through carriage and channel positioning. It is a, a rebalancing of the marketplace to reduce the amount of vertical integration of financial interest by the cable industry and some form, whether it is rate regulation to reduce the amount of cross-subsidy that we believe flows from the sale of broadcast services to subscribers. Uh, you know, I won't give you details, but I think those are the issues we're most concerned about. We are not interested in rate regulation for the sake of being vindictive to the cable industry and have taken a position that should the telephone companies be allowed to provide video transport, that it must be limited to that and in no way allow them into uh, content in any way. Mr. Uh, Goodgame. Uh, well, basically, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hedlund and I would say ba the same things. I, the, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, the telco entry, uh, while not an immediate issue, certainly is going to may be a major issue of the future. Uh, our hope is that we can, uh, that Cable and we, 
Uh, we have great respect for Mr. Mooney and his organization. Uh, I hope that he has respect for ours, and I, I think that uh, our problems are solvable. Uh, that's the primary consideration, because we're going to have to live with each other over the next 10 or 15 years, and we should do so in as much harmony as possible, but in a uh, harmonious atmosphere that includes fairness for all. Uh, and I strongly support uh, our heading in that direction. I think we do have to solve uh, some of the cross-subsidization, vertical, horizontal uh, integration problems. Uh, my concern with Telco is uh, I'm reminded of the old Al Cap cartoon, Little Abner, what's good for General Bull Moose is good for the country. Uh, I'm not sure that General Bull Moose knows what's good for the country. Uh, I don't want to exchange one monopoly for another. Uh, and it concerns me greatly uh, that with the power and strength that the RBOX uh, have, uh, that uh, while we are as an organization uh, saying that uh, to do an overbuild is okay, uh, I have personally great concerns even with that. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, because of the limited time which we have to conduct this hearing this morning, uh, and the fact that there is a very important business on the floor of the House. Um, it is uh, necessary for us to end this first panel at this point. Uh, there is, as you can imagine, an uh, additional uh, number of questions which we would like to pose to each of you, and we will do that in writing and request uh, a speedy uh, written reply to the questions which we pose and would request your assistance in that uh, effort. We apologize to you, uh, but in an effort to give the second panel uh, an opportunity to present uh, their opening statements and to be presented at least with uh, uh, a few questions uh, before we have to uh, end the hearing in about uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, we, at this point, we'll have to beg your indulgence and, uh, and bring to a conclusion this first panel with the thanks of the committee. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Our second panel consists of Professor Dan Stanley Besson, a senior economist from the RAND Corporation, and Dr. Robert Picard, editor of the Journal of Media Economics from the Department of Communications, California State University at Fullerton. Oh, I get a centrist position. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. We very much uh, appreciate your uh, willingness to participate in this uh, set of hearings uh, on uh, the question of the uh, re-regulation of the uh, cable industry. And uh, we would like to begin with a, uh, a longtime friend of the uh, subcommittee, former uh, chief counsel of the uh, Federal Communications uh, Commission who has not now gone on to uh, UCLA School of Law and is a professor uh, there, uh, Mr. Dan Brenner. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Could, could you uh, turn on your microphone, please? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And I'm at, pleased to present my views to the subcommittee on particularly the question of vertical integration in the cable television industry. It's particularly appropriate, Mr. Chairman, given that we celebrate the 100th birthday of the Sherman Antitrust Act the passage of that Antitrust Act this year. I'd like to make five points. First, as a nation, we have generally avoided specifying limits to concentration, vertical or horizontal, in antitrust. Instead, we have allowed the law in this area to develop through the courts so that the intent of the parties can be measured. Second, there are many reasons why cable operators have vertically integrated into the programming supply market and why programmers offer equity to cable operators and there's nothing sinister or anti-competitive for reaching these decisions in many cases. Third, there are many reasons that motivate a cable operator to pick one programming network or program service over another. The fact that a program network is owned by the parent of the cable operator is not the only reason for carriage, nor does it assure that the co-owned network will be carried. I'm reminded of the example a few years ago when, an, when a vertically integrated company, Time, 
uh, which operates systems and programming networks, introduced Festival, which was a family-oriented uh, pay cable service, at about the same time that, that a non-integrated company, Disney, introduced the Disney Channel. They didn't correspond exactly at the same time, but there was some overlap. In any case, the vertically integrated company, Time's entry into this field, Festival failed, went out of business, taken off, whereas Disney has thrived, even though it is not vertically integrated. My fourth point is that the antitrust laws have held for the most part of this century that, that unilateral refusals to deal by a supplier are presumptively legal. Now, in the cable programming context, this means that so long as there is no collusion by groups of programmers, a decision to favor one distribution technology over another is not now illegal. Fifth, if we believe that a firm vertically integrates for efficiency reasons, as opposed to anti-competitive reasons, then a rule prohibiting vertical integration would remove an efficiency from the cable mo uh, programming marketplace. In other words, by imposing a restraint on vertical integration, you add to the cost of operating the video marketplace. And this is essentially a form of taxation, because the higher costs have to be passed on somewhere. Now, this higher cost may be acceptable if the public benefits of breaking up vertically integrated situations outweigh the benefits of efficiencies. But I think that places on the burden, or the burden on those who wish to bar a form of integration to demonstrate with a sufficient degree of reliability that the benefits will actually result. To conclude, I note that the Federal Communications Commission is completing a comprehensive inquiry into the important questions raised by this hearing. I don't wish to prejudge that proceeding, which should provide additional evidence on the very questions you've asked me. I'd simply state that there is no costless way to impose restraints on vertical integration, and that a conscientious legislator should be convinced of the net benefits of such restraints before imposing them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Brenner. Uh, next, Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert uh, Picard, editor of the Journal of Media Economics from, the, uh, from California State University at Fullerton. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity Could to be here. Could you move the microphone here. in a little bit closer, please? I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today, even though I'm flanked by two opponents of my views. Um, there can be little doubt that the uh, development of cable television industry has improved the reception of broadcast signals and provided greater variety in the programming that is available throughout the country today. But the developments over the past two decades have shown a clear preference of the industry toward information and entertainment based on broadcast television formats. As a result of that preference, we now see a handful of entertainment-oriented companies dominating cable channels nationwide and controlling ne nearly every aspect of the industry. It's my belief that the unfettered vertical and horizontal integration occurring in the industry today poses the greatest threat to the public interest that exists in any of the communication industries. The integration already far exceeds that which is permitted in any of the other media industries, including television, motion pictures, and newspapers. I believe that Congress should make every effort to halt further integration and to reduce some that has occurred. The result of the integration is that we now have an industry that is riddled with anti-competitive practices that has harmed consumers by keeping prices high, that has diminished diversity, and has reduced consumer choices. Despite the efforts of many <coughs> firms to indicate otherwise, and my uh, further panelists here today, the industry itself cannot be characterized as competitive because there are too many joint ventures between firms that should be competitors and there is too much vertical and horizontal integration. Today, we have an industry taking $15 billion annually from consumers, consumers who are protected neither by the benefits of competition nor by public regulation of the behavior of a monopoly. One source of the lack of this regulation has been the perception on part of Congress and other executive agencies in the past decades that cable industry represents narrow casting rather than broadcasting. Today, cable has evolved to the point that the major providers no longer can be considered as na narrow casting, but engage in what I term to characterize as medial casting, that is, tending toward serving moderate-sized rather than large or small audiences. The need to regulate that part of the industry, at least, is greater today than ever before. 
When we think of the cable industry and vertical and horizontal integration, it's useful to consider the activities in three separate stages, program production, program distribution, and program exhibition. Horizontal integration may bring efficiencies to a firm's operations on any of these three um, levels. However, particularly when dealing with the exhibition level, MSOs harm the public interest when they promote homogeneity among the services offered by their various systems. MSOs can negotiate for services on all their systems simultaneously and thus provide a standardized fare for their audiences. This type of programming practice harms the general goal of diversity and gives the largest firms excessive power in determining what cable networks or what services will be established and which will survive. Secondly, the provision of standardized cable services by integrated firms, horizontally integrated firms, promotes the bundling of services and their sale to customers, rather than allowing consumers individual price efficient selection. This practice is promoted both because integration creates large system officers th that have only limited cost advantage in the distribution of the services, but gain great cost advantages in the marketing of services. Also, this bundling occurs because there are so few channels offering high quality differentiated programming that would appeal to consumers on their own. Vertical integrated firms also create some difficulties. Um, vertically integrated firms tend to show a general preference for products produced at a higher stage in that integrated firm. Um, thus, cable networks and multiple network providers have chosen to carry programming at the expense of other programming when they have been involved in its production. In some cases, it appears that some system operators have deliberately kept competitors off their systems or at least placed them in least desirable channel locations. There are no significant limitations on financial interest a network or systems operator may have in programming, and this, of course, limits the ability of independent producers or independent networks to market their products. Again, cable network providers have begun bundling as well, and we see the tying of programming together by operators in their sales to systems operators. This practice, again, borders on block booking, and it harms diversity by reducing the opportunity of fledgling cable networks to gain channels on which to be carried. The practice also reduces the ability of local systems officer, op, operators to negotiate reasonable prices for services. Third, in terms of vertical integration, I would argue that there is no difference between the production of cable programming and its exhibition to audiences and the production of motion pictures and their exhibition to audiences. Yet, for almost for more than 40 years, we have forbidden motion picture producers from owning the mechanisms in which they exhibit their programming, but cable program um, producers are permitted to own the distribution and exhibition me mechanisms as well. The nation's cable system was once touted as a means of achieving diversity, of providing the opportunity for narrow casting, and providing service to smaller groups within the community. The efforts of large companies created through horizontal and vertical integration have run counter to that goal. So instead of diversity today, we have variety. Instead of narrow casting, we have medial casting. And within a decade, when economically accessible signals from satellite become a reality, the industry will be broadcasting in many of its networks. The cable industry is anything but competitive today. It is an industry in which exclusive distribution agreements exist between motion picture studios and pay cable services. It is an industry in which cable programming production companies are owned by their networks. It is a system in which both pay and free network programming is owned by exhibitors. It is a system in which four major providers dominate previous premium services and only about a half a dozen financially successful network providers give basic services. We need to deal with those aspects very shortly, or we will find ourselves um, without any competition left in the market today. Thank you, Mr. Picard. Um, uh, our next uh, witness, uh, Dr. Stanley Besson, is a senior economist for the RAND Corporation. Welcome, Mr. Besson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> in addressing the issues raised by vertical integration in the cable industry, I thought the most useful thing I could do today is to provide an historical perspective on these issues. It is important to realize that the issues being considered here are not new. Charges that vertically integrated firms favor their own programs and deny access to the distribution outlets to their competitors goes back to the early days of radio. 
In the case of broadcast television, regulation of the vertical relationships began in 1946 and now include rules that, among other things, limit station ownership, ban exclusive affiliations, prohibit networks from acquiring options on station time, regulate affiliate compensation, and prevent networks from acquiring ownership interests in programs. Now, one might think that with all these rules in place, that the problems created by vertical integration and broadcast television had been solved. Yet when I arrived at the FCC in 1978 to begin work on the network inquiry special staff, my colleagues, my colleagues and I inherited a notice of inquiry that basically asked what additional rules might be adopted to limit the degree of vertical control exercised by the networks. Indeed, the litany of concerns that, appar that, that appeared in the notice seemed little different from those that the Commission had addressed in 1941, and 1957, and 1967, and 1970. The basic a basic conclusion of the inquiry was that additional regulation of vertical relationships was not the answer, whatever the problem was, and that past commission efforts in this regard had been misguided. There were four basic reasons for this conclusion. First, uh, bans on ownership arrangements, vertical integration uh, through ownership, can frequently be circumvented by achieving the same objectives through contract. Second, even where regulation was extended to contracts, it frequently was possible for the parties to, to adopt other contractual provisions to circumvent the, uh, the banned contractual practices. Third, even where policies had some effect, the effect was frequently merely to distribute profits among the industry participants, but to provide little in the way of benefits to viewers. And finally, for some of the reasons that Dan Brenner has already suggested, Bans on vertical integration often forced industry participants to adopt inefficient business practices. For these reasons, we were skeptical that additional regulation uh, would, in fact, provide anything in the way of public interest benefits. The second major conclusion of the inquiry was that the best and perhaps the only way to improve service to viewers is to remove regulatory imposed barriers to entry. Time has vindicated this conclusion, I believe. From a historical perspective, what has made a difference to viewers has not been rules like the chain broadcasting rules or the financial interest and syndication rules, but rather the elimination of barriers to the services that new program, ser so, uh, new program outlets can offer, particularly those that apply to cable. What lessons does this history teach? I think it teaches that it is a mistake to believe that regulation of vertical integration in cable can do much, if anything, to improve viewer welfare. Moreover, it has the undesirable byproduct of focusing regulators' attention on the wrong question. Instead of focusing attention on how regulatory barriers to entry might be eliminated, the tendency is to focus on what are, in the end, at best, uh, ineffective ways of, of dealing uh, with uh, improvements in viewer welfare. In short, vertical integration is at best, uh, the issue of vertical integration is at best the sideshow here. And I would hope that the committee will focus on, not on this sideshow, but on the big top. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Besson. The uh, chair will now recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from the state of New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, yield my time to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. I thank uh, my gracious uh, ranking member for yielding me the time. Many who are uh, concerned about uh, vertical integration uh, in the cable industry uh, propose uh, perhaps the uh, death penalty or the most dramatic or drastic uh, remedy, and that is forbidding cable systems to participate in programming and vice versa. Uh, Mr. Picard, is there a middle ground here somewhere between uh, what uh, you're advocating and, and perhaps uh, the uh, antitrust approach, or indeed is, is in fact the antitrust approach the only um, alternative uh, to an out-and-out -out, uh, ban on that type of arrangement? Well, I, 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 think one of the, I think the biggest problem that we face when you look at particularly the, the, uh, the MSOs becoming involved is not their mere involvement in and of itself. The problem, I think, comes if they tend to exclude competitors or if through their actions uh, and if through their um, desire to increase their financial performance, they tend to exclude channels that are not as profitable for them isn't that, that a, may, in fact, bring diversity rather than um, oh, Isn't that activity a per se violation of the antitrust laws? Um, if it is, it is not being enforced. 
Mr. Brenner? No, I, I believe that the decision to carry one channel over another because uh, viewers prefer it more is, it does not violate either the rule of reason or the per se uh, side of the antitrust laws. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong, I think, in a ca in, unless we turn com uh, cable uh, systems into common carriers, and I don't believe that's being seriously considered by, the, by this committee, uh, there is nothing uh, wrong or sinister in making uh, intelligent, educated choices about which cable programming services to carry. I think the best way that a system should operate, and I think that, that uh, the way that a system operator can sure, uh, clearly evidence its intent to carry popular programs or the ones that viewers want, is to survey their uh, subscribers from time to time and say, what do you think of these uh, channels? And the ones that the si subscribers think are the worst are the ones that get replaced by other entrants. Uh, many systems do that. And I think it's the, the appropriate way in which to integrate uh, subscriber preferences. While we're on the subject, uh, Mr. Brenner, you mentioned uh, support for your uh, original argument, the uh, failure of Times uh, Festival uh, service uh, while Disney uh, thrived. Is that uh, experience the exception, uh, or does that uh, tend to be the rule in your experience? Well, there haven't been that many vertically integrated uh, companies that have launched additional service. Right now, we're seeing sort of the uh, two of them, the two comedy channels, are, are in uh, the throes of either settling or going, are dying uh, an unquiet death. Uh, and in any case, uh, Time Warner, which launched it, which is even a larger MSO now, has had a very difficult time launching the comedy channel. It, it was not able to force the comedy channel into the cable industry. Viacom, which is an integrated operator, but not nearly as big in the, on the system side, has been unsuccessful in launching HA, even though it has some very powerful um, basic services in the, M in the MTV network family already. So I, I, it, th these are very competitive uh, fields. I, I think what, what you're finding as channel capacity lessons, that it's harder and harder for a good idea, whether it's by an integrated, vertically integrated operator, programmer, or by an independent to get it on. It, this is not, if it was 1975 and you had a good idea, you had a much better chance. I mean, let's face it, the Weather Channel uh, doesn't require the most uh, complicated program uh, department. Uh, it sort of depends on the sky for its uh, programming. But that was a good idea. And eventually they figured out a way to get it across. And it's in, you know, 40 to 50 million homes simply the provision of accurate weather information. Uh, but you don't need two weather channels, or, or you might, but it, it, it's harder to launch a second one, particularly where there are very few channel, channels un, unclaimed on most systems today. The, the other thing I, I'd stress, if I, if I may, is that you know, every time you study the question of what consumers want, you, you can give, you can give uh, subscribers 100 channels, as they do in Fairfax. Viewers tend to watch the same 12 to 14 channels. Some studies even make it a smaller number. They don't tend to watch all 100. Now, they don't, they, not every viewer watches the same 100, so it's terrific if you can provide that diversity. But if you ask the typical subscriber, would you like to pay another $7 and get another 50 channels by, by building another, uh, another wire so we can add another 50 channels? Most people say, I don't watch 60% of what I get now. So you know, I'm, it's not clear that I'd want anything else. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try and that new programmers aren't trying. The, the, and next week, the cable industry will launch a couple of new programming networks, and I hope some of them make it. But I, I'm not sure that the, that, that, it's, that, the, that the touchstone at this point is simply whether they're offered by a vertically integrated concern. Uh, Mr. Besson, uh, who's got the best of that argument between Mr. Picard and Mr. Brenner? I thought I made it clear by my statement that I believe <laughs> Mr. Brenner has by far the best of the argument. Uh, first, let me just say it briefly. There's nothing wrong with, with, a, with a retailer carrying the house brand. It's not a per se violation, and that's just, I mean, Television, despite the mystique we uh, surround it with, is in many respects just another industry. Second, vertical integration does give a program, a new program source, an advantage. It no, there's no, in fact, that's indeed one of the efficiencies to which uh, Dan alluded and I alluded as well that comes from vertical integration is that it makes it easier to launch a new program service. The third point is, again, to reiterate Dan's suggestion, it's no guarantee that you're going to succeed, and it's entirely possible for a program service to succeed if it's not vertically integrated. There are lots of successful program services out there that have no vertical links with, with cable operators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I understand the time constraint. Gentlemen's time has expired. And uh, again, let me re-explain that uh, the full committee of the Energy and Commerce Committee is going to uh, meet here in about uh, uh, 12 minutes for a markup of uh, legislation at the full committee level. This is a subcommittee of that uh, committee. 
the uh, Telecommunications and Finance Subcommittee, and uh, we've been asked to uh, uh, conclude these particular proceedings so that the full committee staff can. Uh, uh, the broadcast term is we are preemptible. We we are we are we are, we are, uh, we are our time. Uh, we would notify our affiliates that we're running over, but uh, <laughs> the we're an affiliate, and, uh, and we're being told that we cannot run over. So let me ask. Uh, each of you to give us one minute. What do you want us to remember as we're going through now the pr process of putting together legislation? One minute, no more, and try to be as uh, to the point as you can be. Mr. Besson. Uh, take less time than that. Uh, regulating vertical integration uh, pro provides <coughs> primarily benefits that, that are illusory. Uh, it's much harder to do than you would think, and, uh, and you really keep, ought to keep your eye on the ball, and the ball is worrying about competition, not worrying about vertical integration. Thank you. Mr. Picard. I would say that I think you need Could you to turn on your microphone, please? I would say I think Congress needs to remember that you're not dealing with a single industry but a multi-industry uh, video market here. And while the technologies um, will change and the delivery systems will change over time, the single issue that will remain is that between the exhibition and the production aspects. And I think if one doesn't address that carefully over the next few years and think about that relationship, you will find yourself faced in another 20 to 50 years with the same kind of regulatory action to break up uh, a monopoly in cable as you were faced with breaking up in the telephone monopoly. Thank you. Mr. Brennan. Well, drawing from uh, Dr. Picard, I, I would say that w w this, uh, the 1980s were no stranger to addressing vertical integration problems. The AT&T case is, in fact, an example of a vertical integration breakup. But I do believe that in the cable industry, uh, the uh, advantages of vertical integration throw off some efficiencies. If you take those out of the system, you in, sense, in a sense impose a tax on the system. You make things work more expensively. And unless the public benefits of doing that are very clear and the uh, advocates of it make their case to you, then I'd be very reluctant to do anything but to allow the antitrust laws to work. I would note that in my more formal presentation that I've uh, submitted for the record, uh, there are a number of cases that are actually analyzing some of these questions from a classic Sherman antitrust perspective. And I think we'll all be informed by the outcome of those cases if uh, we get, uh, if those cases are not settled, as to what some of the contours are. That's been the history of antitrust law in this country for 100 years, and I think it's, it's very helpful to pr proceed along those lines. Thank you, Mr. Brennan, very much. We thank each of you for your uh, testimony. We will be submitting to you written questions. We are going to need your help as we're moving uh, through. There are constitutional questions, uh, legal questions, but uh, uh, questions that are quite technical in terms of the vertical and horizontal uh, integration uh, issues especially, and your help will be greatly appreciated. So at this point, we conclude the hearing, and uh, we thank, thank you, you very, very much. much for your excellent testimony. Thank you. Be sure to tune in on Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. on the West Coast for book notes. We will examine the history of South Africa with author Alistair Sparks. His book is entitled The Mind of South Africa. That's book notes coming up on Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up next on C-SPAN, it's a Capitol Hill hearing concerning the ongoing investigation into the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Washington, D.C. You're watching C-SPAN. We would like to update our program schedule for you now, but first you're invited